Good morning, everybody. This is another edition of the Cast Ball Show brought to you by JohnPiello.com, by St. Alwyn's Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. Also by Two Ways, One Pasture Food Truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Glad to be with you the third day of February 2020, day after the Super Bowl. A handful of things we're going to get into today in the world of baseball, sports, and Unify in America. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a Super Bowl recap. There's just a couple things that kind of grind my gears a little bit. And I will kind of talk about it as we get through the show. I was thinking about, uh, you know, Damian Lillard and his performance over the last week or so with the Portland Trailblazers. And I got an interesting take on that. Um, you got another, you had a goalie fight with the Oilers and the Flames. I, I, I want to throw in a couple words about that. You also have the, obviously, a recap of the Super Bowl. But the first thing I wanted to talk about today is just a, a silly narrative. And I think this narrative comes out there with good intentions. It's usually happy people that are excited about something that is to come. But it's amazing how the second the Super Bowl ends of the big event, obviously, we know as the, the Sunday preparation and the party and all the different things that go on with the Super Bowl, from the commercials to the halftime show to all the different things that get discussed. As soon as the game is over, people like to throw out there, hey, it's baseball season. And you know what? The truth is, it isn't. Couldn't be any further away from baseball season. Yes, it, it's a little bit closer than it was before while the... National Football League season was going on as the playoffs were going on. And a lot of people look at the Super Bowl as the turning point as we get closer to baseball. Pitchers and catchers haven't reported yet. You're not going to see games for the better part of the next month. But it still sounds like a cute narrative. Especially if it's a girl on Twitter that is attractive that says it. And somebody says, oh my God, you're right. Baseball season's coming. No, they're not responding to your tweet because they think baseball season's coming. They are responding to the tweet because of what you look like. And the problem that exists out there now is that, you know, there's other sports that aren't getting the respect they deserve. You know, obviously March Madness, you know, gets a little bit of attention in a month of March. We are in the beginning of February now. But, you know, you think of the NBA, you think of the NHL. And yes, there's popularity that exists within their own sport, especially the diehards that are the biggest fans of those respective sports. But do we transition from football with the Super Bowl into baseball? The answer is no. So one of the lamest takes, and I'm going to continue to call it lame, is the fact that the Super Bowl ends and somebody says, hey, it's baseball season. Listen, you could be the most diehardest of baseball fans. It still doesn't make it baseball season right now on February 3rd. So I, my recap or best way to talk about the game from yesterday is pretty much piggybacking off of what the Kansas City Chiefs have done all postseason. Yeah, you look at the San Francisco 49ers, a good defensive team, a team that I thought the Super Bowl was going to come down to how well the 49ers were going to be able to hold off the high-powered Kansas City offense, led, of course, by Patrick Mahomes. And for a while, it looked like it was working. And then as the time went by, it seemed as if the Kansas City Chiefs just kind of did what they did in the previous other playoff games. I don't think the 49ers choked by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, look at the Chiefs and their track record and what they've done in this playoffs, in this series of playoffs. They were down 24 nothing against the Houston Texans. They end up winning that game, pulling away. They're trailing the Tennessee Titans 17-7. to They end up winning that game, pulling away. They're trailing 20-10 to at the end of the third quarter against the San Francisco 49ers, and they end up winning the game, pulling away. So the credit obviously has to go to the Chiefs, and it's not like they haven't gotten enough credit. Obviously, the discussion is going to be about Andy Reid and about the Chiefs winning their first Super Bowl in 50 years, and Travis Kelsey has a brother that played for the Philadelphia Eagles, and the two of them are now Super Bowl champions, and well, Patrick Mahomes as a father that played Major League Baseball. 
He played for the Mets and the Twins. Those are all things that you're going to hear repeated over and over again. As if they haven't been repeated enough over the last two weeks as we got set, went from Championship Sunday to the Super Bowl, which we all know is too long of a time uh, between the championship game and the Super Bowl. But, you know, if you think about it, the, the Chiefs deserve a lot of credit. And their defense, which takes a little bit of a knock. You know, you look at guys like, you know, Mathau and uh, Frank Clark. And they're probably the, the best players on a defense that doesn't get a lot of respect. But in the times, particularly in the Super Bowl, when they needed to stop the San Francisco 49ers, they went out there and did it. And it was the Chiefs defense that allowed the Chiefs offense to be able to put up the points that they needed to put up. Now, here's the one point that I'm going to knock here. Anybody that says that 49ers choked. Yeah. I even go back in the playoffs earlier, and I think the Houston Texans may have choked a little more than the San Francisco 49ers, even though that 24 nothing lead was evaporated really in about a quarter and a half. So it wasn't like the, you know, the Texans... You know, we're just gradually watching this lead evaporate. The Chiefs went out there and started putting points on the board. Similarly to the Super Bowl, once it became 20 to 10 in favor of San Francisco, a couple back and forth possessions, but Kansas City scores to make it 20 to 17. And it's up to the 49ers when they have the ball the next time to either run some time off the clock or put another score on the board. Once the Chiefs get the ball back, the momentum is in their favor. That big play to Tyree Kill, which obviously led to the first score, was a major turning point in the game. It was really the first time that the Chiefs got downfield. And similarly to the AFC Championship game against Tennessee, and similarly to the division game against the Houston Texans, you saw the once the Chiefs were able to get the big play, and they got that confidence. They knew that they could throw the ball downfield to get something big to happen. All of a sudden, their confidence changed. All of a sudden, they were able to mix plays up the way Andy Reid has done for 20-plus years. So it, it's just hard to say that the 49ers choked. I don't really, I don't believe that one bit. The Kansas City Chiefs deserve, number one, all the credit that they get. But if you want to compare this to a Super Bowl, and remember a couple days ago we were talking about the best Super Bowls of all time, and the one that I ranked number one was the Super Bowl between the New England Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons, and the Falcons had their 28-3 lead. And, you know, no matter what you want to say or give credit to the New England Patriots for coming back in that game and winning, tying it up late, getting a two-point conversion, going over time, running down the field and scoring – it was a major choke job by the Atlanta Falcons. That is the example of what a choke in a playoff game is. You know, you want to go back, you know, 25 years or so before that and talk about the Houston Oilers and the Buffalo Bills. And obviously we're talking about playoff game here, not Super Bowl. 35-3, Frank Wright leads the Buffalo Bills back and they end up winning that game. That was a choke job by the Houston Oilers. I can't say the San Francisco 49ers choked. They were beat by a better team and a team that spent a lot of time kind of feeling its offense out. I thought they were going way too much to Damian Williams. Now, a lot of people say that Damian Williams should have been a Super Bowl MVP. Obviously, the 31-yard touchdown run, which ends up sealing the game as the 49ers are trying to get the ball back with a chance to do something. Obviously, that late touchdown makes it a, a two-score game, making it pretty tough for the 49ers to come back within two minutes. But and maybe, and maybe, listen, the person that wants to see Damian Williams or wanted Damian Williams to win the Super Bowl MVP uh, would have certainly had a good point with that late touchdown, a 31-yarder that ended up sealing the game. But I'm watching, as I'm watching the Super Bowl, I'm watching him hand the ball off to Williams. I'm watching Pat Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes throw the ball out of the backfield to Damian Williams. And I'm watching the Chiefs offense go nowhere. And, 
you know, in the end, when it's Patrick Mahomes that wins the Super Bowl MVP, I'm actually validating that for you right now because when they're relying on Damian Williams early on in a game, Chiefs offense is doing nothing. The San Francisco 49ers are controlling that game with their defense. And I don't know if it's a matter of the Chiefs trying to fool 49ers saying, you know, we're going to run the ball with Williams. We're going to hit him with passes out of the flat. We're going to surprise the San Francisco 49ers. We're not going to throw the ball to Tariq Hill. We're not going to throw the ball to Travis Kelsey. Listen, I think that, ended, that, that was a terrible game plan. And it got the results that it got. So they were relying on Damian Williams for way too much in his game. And they don't start doing anything until Patrick Mahomes starts to run the ball a little bit, throw the ball downfield. That, like I said, the pass to Tariq Hill. Downfield was the turning point, I believe, of the Super Bowl, where you started to feel that the Chiefs were starting to build some momentum. Uh, Damian Williams, yes, he gets that touchdown at the end of the game. One of two scores, by the way. And I know he got that, that big touchdown, you know, early on in the game where he, where he crossed, uh, crossed the plane or the goal line. But Patrick Mahomes was the MVP of the Super Bowl. He was the one that led that team back down 10 points. And I understand what it said a lot, if there's a tie or if there is uncertainty when it comes to who the Super Bowl MVP should be. He usually goes to the quarterback. I don't mind that so much. You've seen Super Bowl MVPs that were quarterbacks before that you said or may have argued or had a dispute whether or not they really were the best player of the game or the most valuable player of the game. Chiefs don't make that comeback without Patrick Mahomes. And as good of a performance as Damian Williams had, I'm going to tell you this. They were relying way too much on Damian Williams in the first half of that game, in the first three quarters of that game. And when you're down 20 to 10 through three quarters, the guy you're relying on was not getting the job done. They were not getting anywhere with Damian Williams. It wasn't until Patrick Mahomes started throwing the ball downfield that the Kansas City Chiefs offense started doing anything. And once they started to hit a couple of passes, a couple of big plays, all of a sudden that 49ers defense, which we talk about being so good, and listen, it got them to that point. A 4-12 and San Francisco 49ers team from a year ago went out there and had a 10-point lead after three quarters of the Super Bowl. They got every reason to be proud. But that defense was stopped. That defense was put in a position where it was vulnerable in the most key situation in this game. And the biggest key that was in this Super Bowl was going to be the San Francisco defense against the Kansas City Chief offense. The Chiefs could score a bunch of points against anybody, could they do it against the San Francisco 49ers? The San Francisco 49ers defense could stop just about anybody. Can they stop this high-powered Kansas City Chief offense? And he saw what happened. For three quarters, it looked good. And I may sound a little off here when I'm kind of blaming Damian Williams. And listen, all he wants to do is play football. The game plan, led by head coach Andy Reid, was to give the ball to Damian Williams. And it didn't work for three quarters. So how can you all of a sudden, because he has a late touchdown, and that touchdown was big, you know, it took the drama out of what could have been a, an exciting finish. But he didn't deserve the Super Bowl MVP. So a couple notables on the Chiefs. When we think about the Kansas City Chiefs, who are now the Super Bowl champion, obviously, for the first time in 50 years. But there's a couple members of the Kansas City Chiefs that are going to be Super Bowl champions for an additional time. Defensive coordinator Steve Spagnuolo won a Super Bowl with the Giants as their defensive coordinator in 2007. Dave Merritt, who before yesterday when I read about him in an article, I had no idea who he was. Apparently he was on the Giants coaching staff in both 2007 and 2011. So he wins his third Super Bowl. And Terrell Suggs, who started the season with the Arizona Cardinals, finished the season with the Kansas City Chiefs, gets another Super Bowl ring. Of course, his first one was in 2012 with the Baltimore Ravens. Now, the other point I wanted to bring up, the city of Kansas City. 
and obviously the Royals who won a World Series in 2015. We know now about the Chiefs who have two Super Bowls 50 years apart, 1970 and 2020. The Royals who won a World Series in 2015, but also in 1985. It's time to give a little respect to the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro Leagues, who won Negro Leagues World Series in 1924 and 1942. So congratulations to the city of Kansas City, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the whole thing. This copyright and broadcast is authorized under internet rights granted by the World Wide Web and is solely for entertainment of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, or other use of pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this show without the express written consent of the past ball show, JohnPLA.com and JohnPLA LLC is prohibited. Any commercial or other use of programs, such as by charge and admission for showing, is similarly prohibited. So, just a reminder, it is not baseball season. It won't be baseball season for a little while. And if you think about who should have been the Super Bowl MVP of Super Bowl LIV, Super Bowl 54, it, I think they got it right. Patrick Mahomes should have been it. Like I said, they're relying on Damian Williams way too much in the first three quarters of that game, and it was not getting a Kansas City Chiefs anywhere. He doesn't all of a sudden get the Super Bowl MVP because he gets his second touchdown in, in a situation where the Chiefs are trying to run out the clock. Patrick Mahomes led that team back. He was the reason, obviously, with help from the offense and a little bit from the Kansas City defense. But that's one of the major reasons why they win this football game. Now, I think about the San Francisco 49ers and I know there, there was going to be a lot of pressure on Jimmy Garoppolo. And Jimmy Garoppolo has had a great record as a starting quarterback in the National Football League. The graphic was put up where he was 21-5 and five as a starter for the San Francisco 49ers. And over, over the last three years, including playoff games, obviously up to the Super Bowl, and 49ers in games that were not started by Jimmy Garoppolo over the last three years were 4-20. and 20. So there is a little bit of intangibles that he brings to the table. He did make some very questionable throws in the Super Bowl and something that has been brought up many times when evaluating Jimmy Garoppolo, saying, is this a quarterback that can take that next step and become a top 10 quarterback in a National Football League? And I think he's, he's just got to keep working at it. Right now, you know, the 49ers have done a lot, in the, particularly in the regular season, particularly in the playoffs, found a way to keep Garoppolo's decision-making and execution when it comes to certain plays be the difference in the team winning and losing. They relied a lot on their running game. Obviously, you know, in a situation where I think they were trying to catch the Kansas City Chiefs off guard with some more play action. You know, using the tight end, getting the ball in the hands of Debo Samuel, uh, put them in a very good position, and there were things that were working. That was a, he threw a very very lousy interception where he was basically trying to get the ball out of his hands, threw the ball right to a Chiefs player. He really made some bad throws, and you know the 49ers are going to obviously go with Garoppolo as their quarterback down the road. I mean, he's done nothing but win. I just pointed out the big disparity between games started by Garoppolo over the last three seasons and games not started by Jimmy Garoppolo over the last three seasons. So he's going to be their quarterback going forward. But the talk is going to be, how, how good is this guy? Is he the next Brady? Certainly not going to be the next Tom Brady. He was a guy that Bill Belichick liked a lot, and I think Belichick felt that within his system of the New England Patriots, he could have gotten some success out of Jimmy Garoppolo. I think he, I don't think he's a bad quarterback, but I don't look at him and say, this is a, a, a guy that I'm going to trust to lead my team down the field in the last two minutes of a football game. Sure, you give me a lousy defense, then I think Garoppolo could go up and down the field against them. The 49ers got to the Super Bowl because of their defense. The 49ers got to the Super Bowl because of their running game. Raheem Mozart did not have a huge Super Bowl after rushing for over 100, I'm sorry, 200 yards in the NFC Championship game. Now, Garoppolo 
could have made a couple plays. And listen, you look at Kyle Shanahan, the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers, making, setting up really plays that were foolproof up to a certain point. The working off of the play action, hitting guys over the middle, a um, little uh, lot of activity with the pitching to the wide receivers and stuff. All stuff that, you know, any decent quarterback should be able to handle. But in the end, it really took Jimmy Garoppolo needing to drive the team down the football field. And he wasn't able to do that. Now, listen, how many great quarterbacks have not been able to take their team down in a particular game? Of course, you know, there's many times where the best of the best are, are in that two-minute offense and don't get the job done. Now, Jimmy Garoppolo could have elevated his game or his um, reputation to a different level if he was able to take the 49ers downfield in the final two minutes. It didn't work out. Now, I'm going to reserve putting Garoppolo in my top 10 quarterback discussion. I think he could be top 15, but top 15 in the National Football League means that there's just a lot of quarterbacks that aren't very good. You know, are you putting Philip Rivers ahead of him right now? Probably not. You know, even a guy like Jared Goff, you know, had had a good year, you know, last year, this past year, wasn't that good. Where am I ranking a guy like that? So if you're in the middle of the pack, it doesn't mean you're very good. You know, so I, I think he's got some work to do. I think the 49ers should be very happy with what they did this past year. Like I said, they went 4-12 last year. They really were when it came down to the National Football Conference. They were the they were the best team in the NFC this year. There's very little to dispute about that. They had no problems in either of their playoff games. They sealed home field advantage with a win in week number 17. They deserve everything they got. And they should be considered a good team going forward. I did want to move on and talk a little basketball. And I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Once again, this is the Past Ball Show brought to you by JohnPielli.com by two ways. One passion food truck located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and by St. Aloysius Church and School in Jackson, New Jersey. So Damian Lillard goes off for another 50-point game for the Portland Trailblazers. Now, good for them. They won. But a team right now that's sitting there at 23 and 27. And I give Lillard credit because he's become one of the legitimate scorers in the National Basketball Association and a player that deserves to be recognized a little bit more right now. He is averaging just a tad under 30 points a game. And, you know, for a Portland team that has not had a whole lot of identity over the last five years or so, he, he has become a legitimate superstar. The problem I have is the Portland Trailblazers are sitting here four games under 500. And, you know, the networks are going to go out there and they're going to publicize his 50-point games and maybe the last couple weeks where he's done it a couple times and really has become one of the faces of the NBA. But in the end, what are you judged by? You're judged by the amount of games that you win. You're judged by your record at the end of the season. Now, if you're sitting there and looking at your record, you know, the Trailblazers are in a position where they're on the outside looking in. They have the ninth seed in a Western Conference right now. And it's not that it's not feasible that they can get in with the eighth seed. And, you know, I said this a couple weeks ago, what stood out about the Western Conference this year is that you have two teams, or at least one team, and could make the playoffs with a losing record. And I know the East is, you know, notable for that. They got two teams at 7th and 8th seed that both have losing records right now and are probably likely to finish the season with losing records unless they go on a, a major run. But the Portland Trailblazers are sitting there four games under 500, and I understand why. There's a lot of credit going out to Damian Lillard. He's going out there. He's putting mad points up for the Portland Trailblazers. But, you know, the team brought in Carmelo Anthony, and Carmelo Anthony has done a very good job for them this year. You know, C.J. McCollum's a good player. They made the trade and got Trevor Ariza. You know, this is a team that, yeah, they're, they're playing a little better. And when Damian Lillard goes for 50 points, it should mean that the Portland Trailblazers are winning this game. 
Now they got to get themselves in a position where they are consistent, get themselves closer to 500. As the number eight seed in a Western Conference, are they considered a threat? And the answer is going to be no. I mean, could, could you imagine them playing the Los Angeles Lakers going out there and even giving them a series? At this point, no. So there's going to be a lot of chatter about Damian Lillard and what he's done over the last couple weeks. And, you know, he deserves credit for it. But does he make that Portland Trailblazers team better? Similarly to what the way somebody could ask, does Carmelo Anthony, as happy as he is in Portland, and as happy as the Portland Trailblazers are to have him, does Carmelo Anthony make that team a legitimate contender in a Western Conference? And Damian Lillard may have become a star, but I'm not scared of the Portland Trailblazers because of what Damian Lillard's doing. And remember, Kyrie Irving's hit for 50 a couple times. I think he scored 50 points in the first game of the season for the Brooklyn Nets. They lost that game. So when you're scoring 50 points and your team's losing, I think it takes a little bit away from the 50 points that you scored in that game. So last thing I wanted to talk about today, and sometimes you get this little bit of a mockery when you watch goalies fight in a National Hockey League. And I, I wanted to bring this up on a show that I did a couple days ago, but I figure it, it's a better time to bring it up today. So you got the Calgary Flames and the Edmonton Oilers, obviously a heated rivalry there. You know, we got the, the Alberta battle between those two teams that obviously goes back a long time. It goes back to the days that the Edmonton Oilers were winning Stanley Cup championships in the 1980s. And... You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty chirpy fight or a chirpy game. Some fights, maybe about two, three fights happen. And then you got Cam Talbot throwing haymakers at one of the players in the goal crease. And two players square off. They start fighting. And you see Mike Smith, the goaltender of the, the other team, sitting there. We're standing there right at center ice. And I guess there was some challenge made one way or the other. And Cam Talbot comes up in a goalie's fight for a couple minutes. And a lot of the fans, whether you're a fan of Calgary or a fan of Edmonton, you know, you're kind of sitting there laughing as you're, you're watching this happen. The two goalies who are really supposed to be on the opposite ends of the ice are out in the middle in this main event type of thing, throwing punches at each other. And, I mean, it, it does make the sport look corny. It does sometimes. But it is part of the game. And what we realize about the National Hockey League is that fighting is probably not going to be outlawed anytime soon. It's something that I think is taking a turn, especially when you're thinking about concussions and you're thinking about injuries and you're thinking about somebody that's sitting there just taking punches to the face you know, it's not necessarily good for their health. You know, Bob Probert and the brain damage that he suffered, which likely led to his his early death. I, I, I still don't know what the best way going forward is for the National Hockey League. I'm not going to go extreme and I'm not going to say that fighting should be outlawed because I, I just don't believe it's ever going to happen. But I do think there should be more of an effort made to stop some of the altercations a little bit earlier. And, he, and the refs are doing what they're instructed to do. You know, two players drop their gloves and they square off. And a ref's job is to make sure nobody gets hurt and kind of stand around and watch them fight. I think there should be a little more effort to stop it a little bit earlier and then, you know, secondary altercations that happen, you know, if, if one fight happens after another, that should be a game misconduct situation. There should be more suspensions in games that become more marred from fighting as opposed to the action that's on the ice. I don't think anybody really should mind a dropping of the gloves and two, you know, you know fighters going out there doing their thing. 
But when a game gets marred with fights, I think the referees should take more of a position to take some of the players off the ice. The ones that are adding to the violence that's going on need to be removed from the game. A little bit of a recap of the show today. We spoke about the fact that it's not baseball season. And I don't care how pretty your profile picture is. I don't care how many followers you have. It's not baseball season. The end of the Super Bowl does not sig signify the start of baseball season. There's still a whole nother month of February. And I understand pitchers and catchers are going to report. But, you know, it's like saying that football season starts in, in the days of the beginning of training camp in June or July. You still know there's a long time before there's actually going to be football games played. There's a long time before we're going to start seeing spring training games played let alone rosters being put together and finalized as we get ready for opening day at the end of March. So this narrative that exists out there that the end of the Super Bowl is the beginning of baseball season is wrong. And it's silly and it just sounds, I don't know, it, it sounds stupid. The 49ers did not choke in the Super Bowl. They just got beat by a better team. All you have to do is look at what the Kansas City Chiefs did in their entire playoff run this year. You're, you're looking at a Chiefs team that was down 24 nothing against the Houston Texans. You're looking at a Chiefs team that was down 17-7 against the Tennessee Titans in the AFC Championship game. They were down 10 points in the Super Bowl. They came back all three times. So I would choose to give credit to the Kansas City Chiefs as opposed to talk about the San Francisco 49ers as a team that choked, especially when they don't have a high-powered offense and they don't have a quarterback that I don't think is anywhere near the top 15 in the entire National Football League. Did give a little credit to Steve Spagnuolo, Dave Merritt, Terrell Suggs, Members of the Kansas City Chiefs, obviously the first two coaches, Terrell Suggs, you know, could probably get close to retirement if he wants to. His second Super Bowl ring. So they all now have multiple Super Bowl rings. The Kansas City Chiefs winning their second Super Bowl, 1970, 2020. Kansas City Royals in baseball won World Series in 1985 and 2015. And the Kansas City Monarchs won the Negro League World Series in 1924 and 1942. Spent a little time talking about Damian Lillard. You know, great individual show. He's had a great couple weeks of 50-point games. Has that made the Portland Trail Blazers a better team, though? Are the Portland Trail Blazers a threat in the Western Conference because of Damian Lillard? And I think sometimes we overrate individual performances in basketball and I just think we might want to pump the brakes before we start talking about Lillard's impact on the NBA. He's becoming a star, absolutely. But how good are the Portland Trailblazers? If the season ended today, they wouldn't be in the playoffs. You, know, you talk about what can be considered in some cases a mockery when we talk about goalie fights. There's only been a handful of them that really have happened over the history of the National Hockey League. And you know a lot has to happen in you have to start with the bad blood between the two teams. And obviously, two goalies on the opposite side of the ice have to find some way to get together. That's why it doesn't happen too often. That's why it gets a lot of attention when it does happen. But usually, you'll see some, a goalie involved in some sort of violence on one end of the ice. Maybe a goalie, whether it's a Patrick Waugh, you know, jumping in on a player that is being, uh, being beat up which uh, Claude Lemieux in that, in that particular game for the Colorado Aval Avalanche was getting, you know, just destroyed. Patrick Waugh came to defend him. Mike Vernon came to defend his guy, and all of a sudden the goalies are fighting. That was more understandable. The, you know, Flames-Oilers fight the other day, I don't know. I think it could have been avoided. Yeah, there was bad blood in the game, but, I mean, I mean, it, it looked a little more like a mockery than it looked like two teams really getting at each other. As we hit what we'll call the closing point here at a pass ball show, I'll drop a, another, another question in there.
And let's see, next question we're going to grab here off of Mets Trivia. There you go. What popular cable TV show did Mets pitcher Noah Syndergaard appear as a soldier, soldier in a battle scene? And I think that's an easy question. The answer is Game of Thrones. Uh, let's see. Baseball trivia. Yeah, the nicknames the other day. There you go. Name the batting title winner who beat the runner-up by 40 points three times. I'm going to go with, and the choices are Ted Williams, Rod Carew, Napoleon Lajaway, and Ty Cobb. I'm going to go with Napoleon Lajaway. Let's see what the answer is. Now it was Carew. Rod Carew did it in 73, 74, and 77. In 1973, he hit 350, 44 points ahead of Tommy Davis and George Scott. So imagine he hit 350, and the next player in the American League in the batting race hit 306. In 1974, he beat uh, Jorge Orta, who is remembered, of course, in World Series fame being called safe on that uh, call by Don Denkinger at first base where it looked like he was out. So Carew had a 364 average in 1974. Orta was 316. 1977, Rod Carew hit 388 and beat Lyman Bostock, the late Lyman Bostock, by 52 points. Now at least Bostock hit 336. I mean, it's amazing that, you know, you're looking at, obviously, kind of a pitcher-centric American League batting average being down. I mean, imagine one guy hitting 350 and the next closest guy hits 306. I do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Once again, this is the Passball Show. Always glad to be with you. Um, hope things go well during the week. We'll be back with you on Saturday, Saturday morning, another edition of the Passball Show. Feel free to check out my YouTube channel. We got a couple hundred videos up there. Um, and the best thing I can say about the Passball Show is that there is a description of every single topic that's covered in a show. So one may not appeal to you. If you're a big baseball fan and you, you see some of the titles and the description and maybe it's not so baseball centric, that show may not be for you. But the Passball Show could be for you for any sport that you follow. We do talk a lot of football. We talk some basketball, hockey, college, even a little bit of golf and boxing. So you check out johnpielli.com. And we've got all different shows about all different topics. So hopefully we find something that kind of, um, I guess, uh, you can find some interest in. But once again, we'll be back with you Saturday. God bless you. And as always, I'll see you on the other side.